Welcome to the Stress-Free Dentist Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Block. As always, I want to inspire, entertain, and educate you on the best tools and technologies out there. My goal is to help make your practice and career more profitable, efficient, and most importantly, more enjoyable. And check out all of my nonfiction and children's books on Amazon. And check out the stressfreedentist.com for any upcoming events. And if you're feeling you're a dental professional that's burnt out, or you just feel stuck or want to get to that next level, visit the International Academy of Dental Life Coaches or www.iadlc.com, and we'll get you matched up with a life coach that understands dentistry. I also wanted to thank our amazing sponsor, Equa Marketing. They have helped me and my practice over the years to improve with SEO and website performance. And to find out how you can make your practice dominate in your area, Go to www.equa.com slash MSMSFD to book your complimentary meeting. Again, that's www.ekwa.com slash MSMSFD. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode. And today I'm joined by Dr. Gordon Barfield, and he is the Senior Clinical Manager of Overjet AI. Gordon, how are you doing today? Eric, I'm doing fantastic, man. Um, it's getting warm here in the South in Atlanta, but that's okay. It's summertime. So you're, uh, you're zooming in from Atlanta. Is that where you're from? Yeah. Buckhead, Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And um, I want to get all into all about Overjet AI and just AI in, in general and dentistry. But um, first, I just wanted to hear about your journey and how you got involved with dentistry and ultimately how you ended up uh, working with Overjet. Yeah, that, that, that's a long one, but it's interesting. Um, you know, li like a lot of young people, I um, made a reluctant decision to go to college way back when. Uh, that was in the 80s and floundered around for a couple of years uh, deciding what to study. And I ultimately landed on biology and chemistry because I was kind of a science nerd, kind of a science geek. And then I decided, well, what are you going to do with that? What do you do with the biology and chemistry degree, right? And and one of the things that I stumbled upon was the beauty that is dental practice, dentistry, right? Being, being a dentist, um, dentistry offers so many wonderful opportunities for people to not only have a professional career, uh, an educated professional career, but also to run their own business if they want to do that. And also to have personal and family time, uh, which I think is crucial uh, to 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 anybody that would consider a career path like this. So I consider dentistry as to be maybe one of the most perfect uh, paths that that could be cho chosen. And I uh, looked into a lot of different areas, and so decided to traipse off to dental school. Went to UNC Chapel Hill, uh, which was um, a fantastic experience. Uh, for the listeners, anybody that knows anything about Chapel Hill knows that it's a wonderful place. The School of Dentistry is outstanding. And I had uh, four of the best years uh, of my life there. Uh, but but then at that point of graduating from dental school, that little guy on my shoulder said again, what are you going to do? You know, what, what, what's your path? Where, where do you want to be? And at the time, I thought about any number of the specialties and, and where I would go there. I thought about starting my own practice. I started about associating with an experienced doctor and being a a poor kid from Southwest Virginia, I decided I need some pocket cash because I'd been borrowing money all the way along through the dental school journey. And that led me into the United States Air Force, uh, where I did my first residency in hospital dentistry at Barksdale Air Force Base uh, down in Louisiana. Learned hospital dentistry, pathology, trauma dentistry, uh, was then deployed on Fort Bragg, uh, associated with the 82nd Airborne. We were a support uh, unit there uh, on Pope Air Force Base. And we did a lot of very good comprehensive dental work, including hospital dentistry and trauma dentistry. And I learned a lot about dentistry at that point. Um, proud to have served my country. It was one of the best things that I've done, but it wasn't something that I wanted to make a career out of. So I decided to step out uh, of the military after three years go into private practice. And I went into private group practice in Salem, Virginia, which was my hometown with a college room, uh, college buddy of mine. And we had a really uh, good run there. Uh, I was in a group practice with five dentists. We had a large support staff, loyal patients who paid their bills. We did good work. We uh, had good standing in the community. 
But after about 16 years of that, interestingly enough, that little guy on my shoulder started chirping at me again. And he says, well, what are you going to do? Is this all there is? And although I was, you know, had all the trappings of life that most people think about, cars, homes, vacations, um, plenty to eat, I, I thought there had to be something more to my career and to what I was uh, providing to the world than just dental practice. That led into a about three-year journey of, of self-discovery, if you will, self-reflection, where I ultimately landed upon I wanted to do something different, but I needed to maintain my experience and my leverage in dentistry because I was carrying around a lot of um, experience and a lot of quality to, to provide to somebody somehow. So I made the choice to go back into training and I um, went back to get my orthodontic certificate at the University of Nevada after I'd been in practice for uh, 16 years at that point. So that was challenging and it was different because I was mid-career. I think I was the second oldest orthodontic resident uh, the year that I entered uh, in the United States. And so we had a lot of fun with that, learned a lot about ortho, a lot about growing kids and, and then jumped out into practice after uh, completing that in 2007. And that was when we landed here in Atlanta. And I've practiced here in Atlanta in various capacities ever since. Uh, at one stage, uh, my partner and I had seven orthodontic offices and we drove around the, the state servicing those. And that was fun and we did a lot of good work, but it was exhausting as, as one might imagine. Uh, there was plenty of stress with that as well. And then, as I mentioned before, when Brian decided to leave and go back into academics, uh, that left me to manage three of the offices. We had we had um, disposed of four of them at that point. And uh, I began, began to work those three offices uh, with my wife, Maria, who's also a dentist, foreign trained dentist. And that land, that brought me all the way to 2022, where um, I made the decision I, it was actually a proactive decision. I didn't have any reason to leave clinical practice, but I chose to um, because I was healthy, felt good, felt I could contribute in other ways. And the little guy on my shoulder was saying to me again, well, what do you want to do? What is this all there is? And that led me to the decision to uh, dispose of the practices. We did that in 2022. And in 2023, I... Um, landed here uh, at the country's um, leading artificial intelligence uh, dental company, Overjet. Man, that's quite the journey. I mean, that's like seven podcast episodes in one here. We could <laughs> talk about your your military right. experience, which, you know, thank you for your service. And appreciate uh, it. you were a general, uh, general dentistry for 16 years. And then you went back to uh, orthodontic residency and then you ran multiple orthodontic practices. And then you had the whole uh, experience of selling uh, these practices. And now you're in the corporate world. You're in the, you're on the vendor side. Uh, so you've really kind of seen uh, almost all their, all aspects of dentistry. Well, I'll say this, um, it's been a heck of a ride and, and it's been fun. Don't regret a minute of it. Um, I think all the decisions were the right decisions at the right time for me as a person and as a dentist, they might not be right for members of the audience, uh, but they were the right turns to make uh, for me. And um, I've learned a lot. Uh, I've done a lot of good work. And interesting now, interestingly now, I think that I'm perhaps doing some of the very best work of my career in working um, with dental AI. Actually, I forgot to mention one episode could be the fact that you practice with your spouse. That's a that's a whole story in itself. That is a um, story. <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's let's find out more about Overjet and AI. How did you first get involved with the company? And um, in uh, as best you can, just kind of describe what what Overjet is all about. Yeah, that's um, it, it's another interesting story. When I uh, disposed of the practices in 2022, um, being a curious person, I've always had a curiosity that that's just my nature. I love to read. I love to discover things. I sat out upon a journey to learn about data. I've always been a technology person. I mentioned before science and tech, and I use technology in all of my practices, always an early adopter. 
but I never had the opportunity to dive into data and data-driven decision-making until I retired and had the time to do it. So I set out to study and we did a lot of online work, Coursera, Google Alphabet, IBM, uh, in, in areas such as data science, data analytics, machine learning. Um, I, I learned to code in Python, believe it or not. And that led me to this sort of thought process of, would it be possible to stake a place in the tech sector where I could bring my 32 years of clinical dentistry experience to bear. And over a number of months, I uh, contacted dentists who I could identify in the tech sector who uh, were, were licensed dentists or professional dentists, but were working in tech in, in any capacity. And interestingly enough, I met many of them around the world, uh, including right here in the United States. Took a number of Zoom meetings, uh, with with colleagues and just asked questions and said, hey, is there a spot for a clinical person with an interest in this type of technology to find their way into the tech sector? And the answers were a resounding yes, that we not only have a need for clinicians in areas uh, of data, technology, machine learning, AI, but we have a fairly large need for clinicians uh, because as you understand, this technology has been rolled out in healthcare now in a large way. And I decided to take a stab at, um, at uh, Overjet. I could identify Overjet as being the dental space leader in AI. There are other companies in this space, but we're, we're the leader. And I was fortunate enough to meet um, our clinical team. I mentioned we have 14 full-time dentists. Uh, on Overjet, and it was uh, really a powerhouse team of clinicians from a large spectrum of dentistry. And I was convinced through talking with them that this was the right company to to make this leap. And I did it. And um, I've been here now just over a year. I, went, I came on board May 30th of 2023. And what is what is the software? What is the what is the the AI do exactly? So o Overjet is a platform. It's an online platform that does a number of things. We actually have two sides to this business. Overjet um, is partnered with most of the large insurance payers in the United States to use our technology to automatically adjudicate dental claims. In other words, automatically approve the claims uh, so that they, in the right circumstances, can skip human review. We use an AI read, computer vision, to read claim submissions and say, um, approve or not approve for that group. And it's about 80% of claims now are being auto-approved by, by the AI. The rest of the claims that don't get auto-approved go to human review. So we still have human reviewers in that part of the, the adjudication cycle. But that's just one side of the Overjet business. The side that I work on is called the practice side. And we utilize um, our technology, dental clinics, dental organizations, individual practices, DSOs, um, dental schools, actually, utilize our product. Um, to read dental x-rays and to make ultimately come up with data-driven and artificial intelligence derived insights about things within a dental practice or a dental organization. It basically started with computer vision, but now is in a number of other areas and some exciting things uh, that are coming in the future. So uh, it's essentially uh, helping dentists and practitioners uh, diagnose and treatment plan uh, the x-rays. It's it's a it, it's not going to actually do it for you. It's just a help, correct? Yeah, you bet. I think one of the things I, I like to emphasize when I go around and talk about the product is this is not a diagnosis making machine. It is truly an assist tool, no more or less important than things like a dental explorer, a mirror, your tactile sense, um, a CBCT scan, um, an iTero scan, any of those things that you might find in a dental practice. Artificial intelligence is another tool, another, another uh, arrow in our quiver, if you will, to help us become the best version of our clinical selves that we can be. Yeah, I see it as, you know, I initially started 20 years ago with, with film x-rays and 
it would take forever for those to go through the machine. And yet there were these tiny little films and it's, you know, it's hard to read them and it's hard to explain what you're seeing to a patient. And then kind of the next big game changer was my office getting digital x-rays and, you know, still it's, it was a little bit of a challenge to explain an x-ray to a patient, but it was, you know, much better. And, uh, you could manipulate the x-ray, you could take it and see it immediately. And now I feel like the artificial intelligence softwares that are helping with the diagnosis of these x-rays is like that next level is, would you agree? Um, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I remember the day that, um, digital x-rays hit the field because I was in practice when that occurred, you know, we were uh, for, for, good long period of my practice, we were hand dipping x-rays, right? And when digital x-rays came around, there there was the typical adoption curve. Folks said, well, we can't, you know, um, we can't make that leap. Why should we make that leap? We're doing fine with our hand dipped x-rays. And then came intraoral cameras. I remember the the AccuCams um, and certainly um, practice management softwares, all of the digital initiatives that you can think of. Now, the difference today in artificial intelligence technology and the previous technology shifts that um, we're talking about is that artificial intelligence has the ability and will touch every part of the dental ecosystem. That's what's different from strictly digital radiography or strictly scanning technology is AI will touch everything that we do in a dental practice. And it won't be that long before that happens. It's advancing rapidly. And uh, much like the internet revolution, this will be a technology that um, practitioners in the future, <laughs> in fact, practitioners nowadays uh, really will not be able to live without. This is the direction that technology is taking us. And it is increasing in speed every month. Now, do you find that that some... Uh, dentists, they may have a, a bit of fear of of the you know the words AI. Um, what do you what are you hearing out there uh, from dentists, especially the older generation? Yeah, for sure. I mean, th that's natural human behavior, right? Natural human tendencies to to be fearful of things that we don't understand. I think that's one of my roles here is to be 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 a storyteller and to to demystify, if you will, this technology. There are lots of different types of artificial intelligence. In dentistry, we're using the most basic level of artificial intelligence that there is. It's termed task based, and what that means is that it is asked to do or to provide a very limited scope of service to us, right? And by to us, I mean dental clinicians in this case or human beings, and we control it. Uh, the artificial intelligence that is utilized in dentistry undergoes what is called a supervised learning process. The AI models have to learn uh, to, to, to be intelligent, right? And they are regulated and trained by licensed dentists. That's part of the FDA clearance process. So for the audience who might fear that these uh, technologies, these AI models are, quote unquote, self-learning and can charge off on this uh, data discovery, data ingestion, and then individual decision making process, it's not possible. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. And it won't because uh, we are dealing with human health care here in dentistry. And the, the results of medical devices that are utilized to provide human health care have to be regulated. They have to be controlled and they have to be vetted properly. So as an example, for us to obtain uh, an FDA clearance as a class two medical device, these models have to be tested, validated, retested, revalidated over and over. And then once they're in production and once they're being utilized, revalidated again over time. Uh, so it's all very, very strictly controlled. That's one thing that most folks don't know about. And I feel like that um, I, along with uh, our clinical team here at Overjet, have a responsibility to uh, the public and certainly to our professional colleagues to do just that, to demystify it. So it's not like the Terminator and Cybernet that's going to come and take over my electric handpiece? 
I don't think so. I, I, I think um, it, it definitely is not. But I did hear a good quote from a clinician about two months ago who said, AI will not um, take over for dentists, but dentists who use AI will take over from dentists who don't. And I think that's a very uh, prescient comment. And I think it's it definitely will prove to be true. I I couldn't agree more. You know, we work so hard to get these patients in our our office and you know, it's it's great technology for the practitioner, but it's it's great to show the patient that you're at the forefront of technology and they pick the right dentist. You know, you're showing them that you're up on the latest uh, innovations and uh those are the patients that will go tell their friends and family. Um now I I I like to tell patients it's kind of like a traffic light. There's Green, you know, is is good. Go, and there's yellow, which is caution, and then there's red, which is stop or or bad, and um, that's kind of how I explain the the X rays, um, especially with the with the perio. Um, as the the bone measurements get deeper, there's a big red uh, measurement uh, when it when it's yellow or orange, it's kind of like a caution. Green is good. Patients understand that. So when I point to the X ray and show carries. Uh, there's a big red area. And I say, you know, Judy, this is a cavity. And I point right to the x-ray. It's so much easier for me to explain dentistry and it helps get that case acceptance. So I really like that kind of that traffic light comparison. Oh yeah. I a hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. I think that the, the, it's really amazingly simple, isn't it? We've taken this gray, black, and white grayscale image, which is really difficult to discern. Even for us trained people, it can be difficult to discern these, these things. And we've added color and numbers to it, right? Quantification that without a whole lot of explanation, most human beings can understand at, at a, a very, very base level. And so just the ability to change how we tell the story moves the needle on things like patient understanding and certainly on case acceptance. We have um, very good data now that's pouring in from all over the country about the effect on case acceptance. And it is it is quite impactful. Yeah. And especially if you're busy, you're in a busy practice, you're being rushed um, or you're let's let's face it, you know, my eyes aren't as fresh at at uh, 4 p.m. as they are at 8 a.m. And we get tired, especially as we get older. Um, and if you're a young dentist, I, I used to find that that reviewing an FMX in front of a patient uh, my first couple of years out was one of the most uh, intimidating things to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like this just it's just there to help you. Um, and it does help with with case acceptance and patients getting uh, getting them to move forward with treatment. Yeah, hundred percent. And and the thing that oftentimes we we uh, sort of gloss over, not intentionally, but we do, is the effect on our standardization between um, you and I, as an example. You know, so many dental organizations will have multiple providers, right? And many times, even seeing the same patient. So maybe on one visit they see Doctor A, and on a second visit they see Doctor B. Well, what is the comparison between the two doctors? How are they interpreting the same set of diagnostic data? And that's actually how the company was founded. The company was founded to attack this problem of subjectivity within dental assessment and then diagnosis and treatment planning. And um, so far, it, it, of course, we're a new company, but the data that's coming in uh, says strongly that we're having a very significant positive effect on that. And I think that's good on three levels. Number one, it's good for us as clinicians, right? Because we, sh we want to tell the same story to the patient that's in our office. And that could be between two doctors, or it could be between a doctor and a hygienist, or a doctor and a dental assistant, right? Or a doctor and even an office manager, or treatment coordinator. Number two, if we can tell the same story and perhaps use the same measuring stick as the payers are using, I think that's a win as well, because we want to provide the right dentistry for the patient, right? I think we all can agree on that. And number three, the most important um, level is the patient level. We want to provide patients the care that we know that they need that for a number of different reasons they don't get. 
And one of the biggest of those reasons is the subjectivity in dentistry and the lack of case acceptance and trust because of our um, lack of um, standardization. Yeah, we, we, and I know this is um, pretty much all over the country. There's, there's a lot of uh, need for temporary staff, temporary hygienists, and, and um, you know, they may not be um, up on what your protocols are and it, it keeps things more standardized. If you have temporary staff coming in, um, you know, maybe they're not um, as experienced or maybe there's a language barrier the AI kind of evens that playing field. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, we're hearing uh, many, many reports. I heard one just last week from an office who is utilizing the AI in a very, very unique way. They're utilizing it to train their staff mm -hmm. and to up-level their staff on what is a cavity? What is a, an accurate bone level measurement? Um, what does a defective margin on a restoration look like? And what does that mean to us? And how do we communicate that to a patient that's sitting in our chair. So I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I think that that's one of the really powerful things that the tool, it wasn't necessarily built to train clinical staff, but there's this kind of side effect that comes along with it that I think is a really, really uh, powerful finding in this day and age, where to your point, we're having challenges keeping our staffing at uh, full levels. Yeah. And you know, personally, I feel like it's really helped with bringing up the conversation about perio. Um, I feel that often perio can be over overlooked or or undiagnosed or just not talked about. But when you see the measurements up on the X-ray, uh, measuring the bone levels, it's it just really creates that that avenue to bring up the conversation uh, and you know ask the hygienist: Was there any bleeding on probing? Was there any pocketing here? Uh, Judy, it's 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 showing uh, there's some bone loss here. It really helps, you know, just create that conversation. And let's you know, let's face it, dentistry is hard to explain. It's hard to explain a class two cavity, or, or it's hard to explain um, uh, periodontal disease. So this really helps simplify things. I think that's right, and I think that um, one of the most powerful uh, messages that I've heard and thought about since I've joined this company is the degree to which periodontal disease is going basically unaddressed, basically unaddressed, right? And it is hard because it's painless for the most part. And patients will have symptoms and they'll have real, they'll know they have a problem when it's too late, right? They're not going to know they have a problem um, until late in the course of the disease. And so I think that here is where we as a profession have the largest opportunity to move the needle, right? Periodontitis is the causative factor for 80% of tooth loss. And so if we think about it from, let's say, a community or a global perspective and where we might have the most effect on dental health, I think it lies right here with the perio. And the ability to first and foremost explain it to the patient and then have them to understand it, right? is where we have to begin with that. You're never going to get any success with treating a patient that's reluctant. They may accept some treatment temporarily, only to fall back into, oh, well, I'm still not hurting. I had this treatment and did I really need it type of thing. But now with AI and automation, we have the ability to not only measure these x-rays and these clinical features, quantify them, but then to compare them over time, right? So what does the patient look like today versus what they looked like seven years ago, as an example? And the messaging there is very, very powerful. Uh, again, the reports that I hear from around the field are, we don't have to do quite as much explaining as we did previously, because we've got now color and quantification to be able to tell that story visually. And so folks are finding large successes uh, there. I'm most excited about that part of it. I think that, and and I mentioned to you uh, at one time before, I think I'm doing some of my best work in dentistry now. And it's because I have a hand in helping build and, and, and deploy this technology that has the possibility to affect dental patients all over the entire world in a positive fashion. That's super exciting. Yeah, I think you're also helping dentists. Uh, it, to me, it's it's 
taken a lot of the stress out of uh, discussing treatment with patients or or that fear that I'm going to miss something. Um, it's all, you know, right there. Um, and make no mistake, you know, we are the clinicians, uh, the dentists and the dental professionals and hygienists out there. We're making the decision that I, I, what I like to do is turn the annotations on. I turn them off. Um, if there's a class two lesion, I, I turn it off. I turn it on. I'm confirming um, with myself that that I'm going to diagnose a cavity. Um, I don't leave it up to the you know the, the AI platform. It's it's a like you said a a tool in the tool belt. It's it's not going to make the decision for us. We're still the the practitioners. I think that's a really important take home message. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and uh, we, we often get questions about does utilizing this technology change my liability in any way? Well, the fact of the matter is it doesn't. Uh, you and I and the audience has always had full responsibility for assessment of a patient, diagnosis of a patient, a treatment plan, and the outcome of the treatment for the patient. And there's nothing different today um, in that realm. Uh, we still have to have a dental license delivered by a state board of dentistry. Um, and, you know, that that isn't going to change. But to the point that we have a tool that can help us become better versions of our diagnostic selves, I think we actually have an advantage there that we have never had before. Now, what, what's the future of, of AI and dentistry? Uh, I, I know Overjet is, is helping dentists with, with diagnosing caries and perio and even impactions of wisdom teeth, periapical lesions. Uh, what, what else is in the pipeline? Um, the sky's the limit, my friend. Mm -hmm. The sky's the limit. We're working on some super cool things over here right now uh, regarding dental implants, additional pathologies, disease progression, orthodontics. Um, we just released our newest FDA cleared model, which was pediatric caries. We're now reading caries on uh, pediatric images down to age four. Um, and then you can take it over to the administrative side, uh, narrative notes, chart noting, um, voice charting, um, revenue cycle management initiatives. The, the, the sky is literally the limit. And if you can think about anything that occurs within a dental office, AI will touch that. And, and I, I like to think about it in my mind as the concept of an AI-centric dental practice, right? And a, a dental practice that's wrapped up, has the same mission as it's always had to provide excellent dental care to its, its group of patients, but is wrapped up within this artificial intelligence tool that helps the entire practice do everything that they do better, more efficiently, and more accurately. All right, I wanna wrap up with two final questions. Uh, number one is how do we find out more? And number two, what advice would you give to the young dental professionals out there? Yeah, that, that's a great one. Um, I'm over here at www.overjet.ai, um, overjet.ai. You can uh, see our website there and you can certainly get our contact information as well. Younger professionals, um, I can I take myself back um, 30, almost almost five years now, and I think about stepping out of dentist, dental school and the military into a dental practice. And finally, after a number of years, understanding what I didn't know, um, you don't know anything until you know. And it takes a long time in this field. This is a very, very challenging field um, to navigate. So I would tell young practitioners today to have a sense of humility, number one. I think that's critically important for your success. Have a lifelong learner attitude, number two. And certainly today, that involves technology. Um, technology is not going away. It will increase its penetrance within your dental practice um, for as long as you practice. So adopt technology and make sure that you understand it, understand what it is, and understand what it's not. And then I think the last thing would, to, would be maintain a sense of curiosity, and excitement about what you're doing, no matter what you do, whether it's practicing clinically, uh, being within a university, training up the next generation, serving in, in the armed forces, or serving an industry like I'm doing now, you will be helping dental patients, dental clinicians um, around the world and your colleagues 
to get better over time. Uh, that's great stuff. Dr. Gordon Barfield, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again for listening to the Stress-Free Dentist podcast. And don't hesitate to get in touch with me at info at the com. And if you haven't already, please subscribe on your favorite platform and leave us a review. Until the next episode, I'm Dr. Eric Block, the Stress-Free Dentist.